sure about that, but I have to have it taken. The new call is full of possible testimony. Hello and welcome to an adventure. Uh, this is Archival Adventures live on twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios and twitch.tv slash Rogan27. Um, I hope that you're all having a great week. We've reached Wednesday, which means that the week is half over for most of us. Um, I do have just our standard, you know, uh, announcement that I do at the top of the stream. So I'm going to read the land and labor acknowledgement for the university. Um, and then we'll talk about what we're going to look at today. Uh, it's good to see people here already. Um, so just give me one second while I read this. Uh, also, just uh, the, the lights. I, can't, I can barely see what I'm looking at now. Um, all right, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their land and waterways. Uh, we further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved Black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Utpro Sim, that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So that is Virginia Tech's
statement about land and labor here at the institution, and um, they put that out there basically asking that people hold them accountable for it, so do. Um, anyway, welcome everybody. Uh, I am um, Anthony Wright de Hernandez. I'm the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. Uh, which means that I prim primarily have responsibility for our collections uh, relating to historically marginalized communities. Um, those are what I work with the most, uh, but that's not the only thing I share on this stream. This stream is for whatever strikes my fancy. Um, actually, before I dive into exactly what we're going to talk about today, I do want to say hello to the people who popped into chat so far. Uh, so, uh, hello Fluidan and Key Squared and Hannah, um, Millie Glitch, hi. Uh, Fluidan, thank you so much for the resubscription with Prime. Uh, Prime. Um, the most comprehensive and action-oriented statement you've heard yet. That one is newly revised this past year, Millie Glitch. Um, and it is definitely an improvement over the language that we had before. Um, and, and right now, right there, we're getting a raid from 16-Bit Eric. Hello, Whimsies. Uh, welcome in uh, to the stream. Um, this is Archival Adventures. Um, you are all joining on twitch.tv slash Rogan27, which is my personal channel. Uh, this stream also goes out to my uh, library's Twitch channel, which is twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios, uh, which is why if you um, have been to my channel before, uh, not all the bells and whistles are active for this stream, but welcome in everybody. Um, I, you would know me uh, on that channel as Rogan27. I'm Anthony Wright de Hernandez, the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. And on this stream, I share materials from the Special Collections and University Archives at Virginia Tech, uh, which is what we're going to be doing today. And I see we have a hype train going. Um, so let me, let me give some thank yous out. Uh, Fluidan, thank you so much for the resubscription with Prime. It is great to have you supporting me that way. Eric, of course, thank you so much for bringing the whimsies by. It is always a joy to have you all join us and um, explore these collections with me. Um, Mobius Tempest, hello. Uh, Rykar, thank you so much for the resubscription 13 months. Hi. Uh, Abyssal Icarus, hello. Be Right UK, thank you for the 500 bits. Um, Lord Portico, welcome in. Of course, uh, one of my, my, my newest mod on my channel. Um, it is great to have you here and always good to have your support. Thank you for dropping the shout out to Eric. Uh, just here for coffee, hello. Um, <laughs> you thought I might be hiding in the archives. Um, Be Right UK, thank you so much for the five gifted subs. Um, and welcome to the Rogues Gallery, o Okashi, Urban Bohemian, uh, Tater Tot, Galara Dragon, and um, Higgledy Jigger. And uh, Lord Partica, thank you for the 500 bits. Um, we haven't had a hype train during the archives stream in a while. Um, it is always fun to have uh, everybody drop in and, and show support. It means a lot to me, especially. Um, and, and this is actually one of my more better watched programs, the Wednesday show. Um, so it, I appreciate having you all here. Um, Key Squared, thank you for the 100 bits. Um, while that is going on, I'm, I'm going to actually finish the introduction because we have a shorter amount of time on Wednesdays than on most of my other streaming days. Um, the collections that we're looking at today are two small collections that are related to botany. And there's a bit of a story about how I ended up picking them, why we're looking at them, um, because basically I was looking for inspiration. I was exploring our finding aids, looking to see what might be available and what I might want to look at during the next couple of weeks, trying to do some planning ahead rather than just like last minute picking things um, right bef before stream. Um, and so I was just exploring and I decided to explore our marked subject headings. So um, uh, it's just one of the, the ways that the data is cut so that we can, uh, so that users can explore on our finding aid site, which is Virginia Heritage. Um, and I was just looking down the list of things and, and clicking on any that seemed somewhat interesting just to look and see what there was. And one of the headings was just botany and it said that there were two collections that were marked as being or at, at, marked with the subject botany and for our finding aids we tend not to mark more than five subject headings which means that um, 
these two collections should have a significant amount of content about botany. And so uh, if we were really researching botany or something botany related, there would be other ways to go about finding things, identifying them, pulling them, looking at them. But it just struck me as interesting. These two happened to get the subject heading botany attached to them. And so I thought we would take a look at them today, see exactly what's in them. One of them is a scrapbook that is mostly photographs, and one of them is mostly documents and papers that includes correspondence with Thomas Edison. So I thought that this would be fun. Yeah, it's a plant day today. Um, but very specifically, like, why these two collections? Because I know they are not the only things that we have that are botany related. Uh, but they're the only two finding aids that we have that have the subject term botany attached to them. So that is kind of how I arrived at the two collections we're going to look at today. They're not specifically related to each other in any specific way, uh, other than having this subject term botany attached. And they're both really small collections, but um, when I was looking at them and I was like, oh, this one's photos, and oh, this one has letters with Thomas Edison, I was like, I got a stream. This, this is going to be interesting. So that's, that's where we got it. Um, <clears throat> I do see that we have a level three hype train at 57%. Thank you all so, so much. Um, oh. Okay. I'm, I'm getting messages out of date because I wasn't actually looking at where the messages were. Um, <clears throat> and, all right. Yeah. So, how about we actually start looking at one of them? Um, <clears throat> I will let you decide, since you're the viewers, do you want to start with photos or do you want to start with documents? <clears throat> and I don't, I don't have a poll set up for that, so if you want to just drop in chat whether you'd prefer photos or documents. <clears throat> Pardon me. Anybody. Documents. All right, that's two for documents. <clears throat> photos. <laughs> so two for documents, one for photos. I'm looking to see. Yeah, we will get to both of them today for sure. But yeah, we can start with documents. And it looks like the hype train has ended. Thank you all so much. We completed, it says complete at level three. So thank you all so much for your support. Oh, on my bracelet? Um, this is actually a, medi a med alert, medical alert bracelet for my medicine allergies. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just got a pattern on it. And so it's the caduceus on, on the backside there. Um, let's see. I want document focus. It says completed at level three, but we only completed level two. Um, so you should have gotten some level two emotes with that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty cool one. Um, I believe... Uh, I got it from a site called Lauren's Hope um, that was basically a woman's daughter uh, who was diabetic, didn't want to wear the, her medical alert because it was the standard like bare bones one that they'll give you at the, the hospital or whatever. Um, and she was like a teen and didn't want to wear it. So her mom just started designing nicer looking jewelry as medical alert bracelets so that people would actually wear them. Um, so that, that is where that comes from. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that um, on one of my other streams, actually. Uh, today, I, I try to divert back to the main topic just because this is supposed to be like focused on the collections. Um, I don't mind digressing a little bit, but I will steer us back. And if you want to bring it up again on another stream, I'm happy to discuss it in more depth. Um, all right. So uh, what we have to start with um, are the documents. Oh, no, no. Abyssal Icarus, it is totally fine. I don't mind um, you bringing it up. It's 
Uh, I'm just explaining why I'm not going in, like, because I would happily, like, share their website and do stuff like that if it was my personal stream, but this one is for work, so I just tend to try and steer back to the main topic a little bit faster. Um, otherwise, I don't mind getting distracted. All right, so the first one that we're gonna look at is the George Myron Shear Papers. Uh, these cover a time period from 1927 to 1986. Um, and let me just uh, read you a little bit of biographical information about George Myron Shear um, so that we know kind of what we're getting at. And oh, I was, I meant to switch so that you actually see the folder that we're, this, the first folder here. Uh, George Myron Shear, son of Cornelius and Avis Morrison. Sure, wow, okay. Let me try that again. George Myron Shear, son of Cornelius and Avis Morris. Take three. George Myron Shear, son of Cornelius and Avis Morrison Sherwood Shear, was born in Maryland on October or on August. Wow, on April 25th, 1905. Uh, he earned a bachelor's degree at the University of Maryland in 1927. The 1930 census shows George Shear living in the Arlington, Virginia home of his parents. He's described as 24, single, and unemployed. Later that year, Shear married. Olala Elaine Glasgow, uh, who lived like him, oh, sorry, who like him had obtained a master's degree in botany at the University of Illinois in 1928. The Shears would have four children. Also around 1930, Shear started work at the Virginia Agricultural Experiment Station as a plant, uh, plant physiologist. <clears throat> so the Virginia Agricultural Experiment Station would mean that we likely have this collection because it has a connection to Virginia Tech, because the Ag Experiment Station is part of Virginia Tech's extension programs. Uh, in 1949, he became a professor of plant physiology at Virginia Polytechnic Institute, uh, which is Virginia Tech. He was a pioneer in developing no-tillage farming techniques during the 1960s and was a noted expert on the cultivation of watercress. Uh, George Myron Shear retired from Virginia Tech in 1970. He died in 1990 and was buried in Blacksburg's Westview Cemetery. Um, so the collection contains his papers. He was a pathologist, a plant pathologist and physiologist uh, from 1930 to 70. Among the correspondence are several 1927 letters from the laboratory of Thomas A. Edison regarding a project in which Shear was to collect for the lab various botanical samples of plants containing a milky latex. So I think that is where we are gonna be starting is the Edison Laboratory correspondence. Words are hard, yes. <laughs> Icarus, I think this is my favorite of the pins. Um, yes, watercress is tasty. All right, so box one, folder one here. Um, I think, yes, I do have the light on. Uh, lighting in this room today is is fine. It's just also distracting me. Because uh, if I look at the camera, I, I go light blind for a, a minute. Um, and then it seemed like there were shadows on the folder here. And actually, I do feel like there might be, no, no never mind. I'm going to stop distracting myself and we're actually going to look at a document. Uh, I apologize. Today I'm apparently very, very distractible. But let us start with uh, what appears to be a photocopy. We do have originals later in here, but the first one in here is a photocopy of a letter. I'm going to zoom in just a bit because I can. Cable address, Edison, New York. It's the whimsy, you brought it with you from Eric's stream. Well, yeah, it's also that I'm easily distracted. So, uh, from the laboratory of Thomas A. Edison, Orange, New Jersey, June 27, 1927. Mr. G. Myron Shear in Roslyn, Virginia, Dear Mr. Shear, your letter of June 25th has been received together with the bill for 
the car purchased for my account and paid for by your father. A check for the amount to your father's order will be forwarded to your address right away. You do not say whether a license has been issued for this car. If not, please take out the license in my name and send me the number right away. Please also give me the following information. Make of car, type, year, serial number, motor number. It's gorgeous header, uh, this licorice. Um, of course, I shall take out insurance for fire and theft and also liability insurance. Uh, when you send me this necessary data, I will have some accident blanks sent to you for reporting any accident, no matter how slight. However, I trust there will be no occasion to use these. I love the gentle caution there that you better not get in an accident in this car that I just bought and that you're going to be driving. Uh, you had better not run the car until these matters have been attended to and until you have received your instructions, which will be within a few days. Yours very truly, Thomas A. Edison. Not a scratch! <laughs> I apparently bought you a car. What is it? Um, now, I don't think... So, I don't think these letters are necessarily fully in chronological order in the folder. Um, it's possible that they are and that this is the first of the letters of correspondence that we actually have. Uh, let me see. July 1, July 8... July 12, July 16, August 2, September 2. I, I guess they are in chronological order. Um, so this might be the first one that we have. It references earlier correspondence. And as with off, as with often, or as, as is often the case with correspondence, uh, these come from George Shear's papers. If we wanted to find the other side of the correspondence, we might have to go and visit an archives that has Thomas Edison's papers, and they might have that correspondence. There's no guarantee that they will, because likely from their end of the conversation, it was not considered um, especially important correspondence, because George Shear wasn't a really important person. But it's possible that they have the other half of this conversation and that by visiting our archives and their archives, you could get the entire uh, back and forth correspondence. Um, we will... Uh, Millie Glitch, um, you're asking about the instructions referenced and I do believe that the other letters are going to give us more on that. Um, so we will uncover that as we go. The cable address in the header. Yeah, it's like an email address, only for 1927. Um, <clears throat> so the next one that we have, we have this lovely envelope. Um, or, well, part of an envelope. And we have... Oh, no, this is, this is an, an, an attachment to the letter. Some of them have envelopes attached, so I thought this was going to be an envelope, but um, we'll read the letter first and then we'll look again at the attachment because there's, there's more than just what I showed you. Cable address, Edison, New York. From the laboratory of Thomas A. Edison, Orange, New Jersey, July 1st, 1927. Mr. H. Myron Shear, um, eh, it's Myron. You got the first initial wrong on this one. Oh well. Dear sir, <laughs> I am enclosing the instructions. I knew we were going to get to those instructions for collecting latex bearing plants in accordance with our previous correspondence, which please read carefully. My financial office will send you an express company's check for $100 as capital for your expense account. <clears throat> so company car and an expense account. That's pretty good. <clears throat> and did, did the finding aid, I can't remember, did it say when he was born? Born in 1905, so this is 1927, so he would have been um, 22? 
if my math is mathing correctly. Uh, and he's got a company car and an expense account. <clears throat> I'm also sending you to an incomplete list of the euphor euphorbias. It is the euphorbias that promise to be the best kind of plant for my purpose. I have stated in what places the plants are found, uh, wherefore I have been able to find them in the sources of my information. Or, sorry, wherever. Uh, the photocopy has a couple letters missing there. Uh, the United States has not been thoroughly explored, and I think that many plants mentioned as growing in foreign countries will be found also in the United States. Lists of the... Oh, wow. Uh... Asclepiadaceae Apocinaceae and other families will be sent to you in the near future as soon as I get your first address on the road. None of these are as promising as the Euphorbiaceae. Uh, Euphor Euphorbiaceae. I love... Yeah, milkweed family. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> I love uh, sight reading things and coming across complex um, Greek formulations of scientific names for things because they're not actually Greek words. They're just constructed words using Greek elements that are then used as scientific names for things, which means they're sometimes very difficult to pronounce, um, especially for an English speaker. Anyway, uh, so a couple of different scientific names for types of plants to look at. Uh, for each one of the plants received by me from you, men, or received by me from you men in the field, a herbarium card will be made. And identification will be sought by comparison at the herbaria of botanical gardens in Washington, New York, and other places. Um, we are fortunate in having one criterion that is certain, and that is the latex flow on cutting. If a new species is discovered, the finder will get the credit. <clears throat> Yours very truly, Thomas A. Edison. P.S. The territory you are to cover is shown on the enclosed map. <laughs> yes, English is chaos with suggested guidelines. So this is the enclosed map, and you can see um, the area outlined in black. So it's from the Chesapeake Bay up through the Piedmont. So the, the, we've got the coastal or the tidewater region, um, the Piedmont, and the mountains. Uh, but cutting off the very northern part, which would include, um, that's going to be like Loudoun County, Fairfax County, um, uh, that sort of area up there, Arlington, Virginia, um, uh, over into, I think that's going to be over into, um, I want to say Franklin County. I can't remember which county Winchester is sitting in, but I, I want to say Franklin. Uh, but so that that northern part, uh, including Winchester and uh, um, Fauquier, is it, I think it's Fauquier, no. Now I'm trying to think of my Virginia geography. Um, it is most of Virginia. Uh, so this is going to be... It's excluding places like Winchester, which uh, would be kind of up in this area here. It's excluding the entire like DC metropolitan area. Um, and my brain is just like, I used to drive up there all the time. And so I feel like I'm, uh, it's Leesburg. So Winchester and Leesburg and the DC Metro are excluded from this. Um, But then also excluding the kind of tail end of Virginia down here, um, 
which is Southwest Virginia, which would be basically everything it looks like from Roanoke onward, or Roanoke West, just based on where that line is. Um, so excluding where Virginia Tech is here in Blacksburg, um, and just looking at where that line is, Roanoke might actually be included in the area, but Blacksburg is definitely excluded. So it might be basically go east from where you are in Blacksburg. <laughs> actually, I don't know if he was in Blacksburg yet at that time, but uh, basically east from Blacksburg and then north up to... Based on this, I would say north up to about Harrisonburg and all the way east to the coast, but excluding the Delmarva Peninsula over here. Uh, so Tidewater, Piedmont, and mountain parts of Virginia from Ro Roanoke East and Harrisonburg South. <laughs> <clears throat> and then uh, it had a little note in with it. Mr. G. Myron Shear will please cover as much as possible of the, ter of the territory within the black line of the attached map. So basically, go out and find, uh, find plants that will seep out milky substance when cut. Similar to a milkweed. Um, I actually think that this is a really interesting set of letters already, and I've only looked at two of them. <laughs> I might just be a little starstruck that these are letters from Thomas Edison. Um, one second. I'm trying to get this put back together properly. <clears throat> So those first two were photocopies. This next one is actually original paper, which is surprisingly good condition. And we have the, uh, the envelope. Where's Ula's galley when we need them? <laughs> Key squared, yeah. Um, laboratory of Thomas A. Edison, Orange, New Jersey. We have a two cent United States stamp. This was, uh, letter was canceled in Orange, New Jersey, um, July 8th of 1927 at 8 p.m. But it is a, a George Washington bust on a two cent stamp. For anybody who's interested in philately out there, uh, I, don't, I doubt that that's actually worth much. Uh, but if I'm wrong, do let me know. 95 years old, yeah. Uh, if, if you're unfamiliar with the word philately is um, this, essentially the study of stamps. It's like stamp collecting. A philatelist is a stamp collector. Um, cable address, Edison, New York. From the laboratory of Thomas A. Edison, Orange, New Jersey, July 8th, 1927. Dear Mr. Shear, your letter of July 6th has been received, and in reply to your first question, I would say that it is my preference, of course, that perennials be collected, but what I am particular about is to get plants that have a milky latex. We have been successful here in transplanting annuals as well as perennials. You need not send any species of ruse unless they are very uncommon. The sumac of this family contains a milky latex, but has no rubber. So now we begin to get at the purpose of collecting uh, plants that secrete milky latex. You need not gather or collect the ordinary species of milkweed, as they are growing around us here very plentifully. If you should happen to come across some exception varieties of Asclepius, you may collect and send them, but not the ordinary milkweeds, as we have plenty of those. Be careful about the packing for shipment. Of course, you will use the um, sphagnum moss and the newspaper and wrapping paper for the roots, but do not have the upper part of the stem and leaves too closely packed because in warm weather they are apt to ferment and thus be spoiled in shipment. Uh, provide plenty of ventilation in packing box. Handwritten note, um, or handwritten modification. I do not know what you mean when you say that you are awaiting the license tags from me. 
Has not a license been taken out on the car? The car is to be operated in Virginia. Do I understand that a non-resident can take out the registration license? Please let me know fully about this so that we may save time. Did you get a bill of sale for the car? If not, you should obtain one. Otherwise, there might be difficulty where, while you are on the road. Uh, yours very truly, Thomas A. Edison. Um, I don't know what this squiggle here is. I'm wondering if this was... Uh, if the handwritten items here were not actually done by Thomas Edison. Um, but I do note this was uh, ediphoned. So he used um, an ediphone to do this letter, um, which is a, dicta a dictation machine. Um, which is why I'm thinking that the handwritten stuff well, I don't know. The signature may be his. But it's also possible that his secretary signed it for him. Oh, Hannah, thank you for gifting a sub to Abyssal Icarus. Uh, welcome to the Rogues Gallery, Abyssal Icarus. Uh, and we have another letter that was paper clipped with that one. So possibly that it was filed in the same envelope. Unclear... Nope, very clear it was not sent in the same envelope because the envelope was uh, canceled on July 8th and this letter's from July 14th. Um, from the laboratory of Thomas A. Edison, Orange, New Jersey, July 14th, 1927. Dear sir, your letter of July 8th was received and we sent you by express a bale of sphagnum moss. I trust it has been duly received. As to boxing, Mr. Edison wishes me to tell you to try the experiment you have suggested. Should the plants arrive dry or injured, we will report immediately. Mr. Edison's impression is that something stiff like a board should be used or the plants will be bent badly, and he wants them for planting. I have not heard from you as to your license. What is there that can be done to put the thing in right shape? Please look into this matter and write me fully about it as soon as you can. There is another thing. You did not send us a bill of sale, which should be given by the vendor. This you might find absolutely necessary while you are on the road. Yours very truly, uh, William... I'm uncertain. It might be Meadowcroft, assistant to Mr. Edison. The handwriting there on his looks very similar to here. I do believe that uh, Meadowcroft, and that's this is W H M his initials here. So he signed for Thomas Edison on this letter. And it is William, uh, William Meadowcroft is what it looks like to me. If anybody wants to look up Edison and know, uh, or, and can tell me what, uh, more about Meadowcroft, that would be cool. The first two that are photocopied here have Edison's actual signature or had Edison's actual signature. Um, you can see with the big swoop uh, whereas this one does not have that big swoop, and that's because Meadowcroft signed it. The idea of getting a bag of moss in the mail is just funny. Yeah. Um, well, and they're talking about arrangements for shipping plants uh, for later, like, for basically transplanting them across state lines um, by sending them through the mail. I do not believe that this is something that would be possible to even do today. Uh, I think you can send seeds through the mail, but I do not think that the U.S. Postal Service would send actual plants because of risk factors for invasive species transplantation. Um, I, I would be surprised. According to the internet, Meadowcroft was Edison's personal secretary. Yeah, uh, so he, he notes himself down as assistant to Edison. Um, and apparently, uh, William Henry Meadowcroft, 
Um, I am amazed that I managed to get his name right from his signature because you have the W. I could not make out the H, which confused me a little bit, but you've got the W with the tiny little M leading off of it um, that goes into the first side of the H. And then you've got the beginning of the H that goes directly into the M from Meadowcroft, but the T at the end looks like a cursive Z. So just the fact that I was able to make out that it was William Meadowcroft just from the signature um, basically just tells you that I have looked at a lot of old handwriting. Um, William Henry Meadowcroft, 29 May 1853 in Manchester to 15 October 1937 in Boonton, New Jersey, was the secretary of Thomas Edison. Thank you, Rykar. It's more legible than your sign. Yeah, oh, it's way more legible than my signature. So this one was sent to Myron Shear, care of R.A. Graves in Syria, Virginia. Again, we have the Washington two cent stamp. Uh, from the laboratory of Thomas A. Edison, Orange, New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, oh, I mean, Wikipedia is helpful, but you're the one that went out and grabbed it. Um, and for like simple things like that, where they even had a, um, a notation in there, they've got a footnote in there that will take you to that the citation that confirms that it's accurate information. Um, for quick reference stuff like that, Wikipedia is not a bad source. Uh, you wouldn't want to rely on Wikipedia if you were writing a paper um, for for stuff. Like you want to take, you can take Wikipedia as a starting point, and it will point you to resources that you could that you could cite. Um, but you wouldn't cite Wikipedia directly on something like that. Um, yeah, uh, but as like a good primer. Uh, to get a basic gist of a subject or to look up specific details that you can then use that information to do actual research based on. Wikipedia is a great source for stuff like that. It's a basically a community, like it's like going and asking your friend, hey, do you know this? And they say, oh yeah, I know that. And then you say, great, can you point me to some resources? And they're like, sure, go and look at this, this, and this. That's what Wikipedia is only in text form. Um, all right, July 12th, 1927, uh, Dear Sir, Mr. Edison desires me to request that you will not collect specimens of the ordinary variety of milkweed, nor of sumac, thistles, or wild lettuce. We have an abundance of these around here. Y very truly yours, uh, William, uh, wow, I, I lost his name already, William Meadowcroft, assistant to Mr. Edison. P.S. So long as the plants give latex and are not of the kind above specified, there need be no special delay by reason of your trying to identify the plants collected. We shall send one out of each bundle of your, we, we shall send one out of each bundle of your specimens to the New York Botanical Gardens for identification. Be sure to allow abundant ventilation in your boxes and do not wrap leafy ends too closely or they will ferment. Hmm, it, it certainly seems like um, Sheer may not have been paying full attention to the letters that he received. And so far, we don't have a lot of explanation as to why they want this. There was that mention of rubber, um, which if you, uh, in the finding aid, there's actually, let's see, um, There is a note in here in the scope and contents uh, correspondence are several tw 1927 letters from the laboratory of Edison regarding a project in which Shear was to collect for the lab various botanical samples of plants containing a milky latex. Included among these are photocopies of two letters from, from Thomas A. Edison. So we don't actually have any directly from Edison. Uh, most are just from his um, laboratory and I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised in the least that we have photocopies of the ones that had Edison's signature and originals of the ones that were from his secretary. Um, the ones that had his signature were probably sold individually for a lot more money than we were willing to pay. Uh, the project arose from Edison's attempt uh, to develop a cost-effective do domestic production of rubber. 
So this was an Edison project to try and create production of rubber here in the United States. Yeah, he was sourcing plants to try and, and uh, come up with cost-effective production of rubber in the U.S. In 1927, Edison, Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, and Harvey Firestone were concerned about America's dependencies on foreign rubber sources for its industrial enterprises. The three men formed the Edison Botanic Research Corporation. <laughs> Portico, it is totally fine. I, I'm happy to read the finding aid to you all. I thought we had gone far enough into the letters that I should clarify, like, why are they looking for these plants? Because it's in the finding aid. That's not necessarily always going to be the case. That might be something that would require further research and that you'd be like, well, why did they want these plants? And then you go and you look at Thomas Edison's papers and figure out what he was doing in the 19, the late 1920s um, that had to do with milky, milky, milky latex. And you would figure out that he was working on a project to create domestic U.S. production of rubber. Um, in response to your note of July 14th regarding license for automobile, still dealing with the Virginia De Department of Motor Vehicles, apparently. Um, will you kindly have the car registered in the name of Thomas A. Edison and get a set of Virginia license plates? Kindly advise when you have done so, giving us the license number, motor, motor number of car, serial number, and any of her data which you think will be useful. Yours very truly, John V. Miller. <laughs> oh boy, and this this is not on the nice florid letterhead. This is just Thomas A. Edison, Orange, New Jersey. And this is from John Miller, who's like, Would you freaking register the car already? And send us the paperwork. We got you a company car, just do the per do the do the paperwork. <laughs> Very kindly, do it or I will find you. <laughs> Please, I need to submit this expense report. <laughs> I mean, it's been hanging out there for a couple months at this point. <clears throat> Thomas A. Edison, Orange, New Jersey, August 2, 1927. Mr. G. Myron Shear, General Delivery, Lynchburg, Virginia. General delivery. So this just goes to the post office and he has to proactively go to the post office to pick it up. Or if the postman knows where he's staying, the postman will deliver it. And in the 1920s, Lynchburg, it's probably possible that the postman knows exactly where George Shear is staying in Lynchburg and will deliver the letter to George Shear in Lynchburg because Lynchburg in 1927 would be significantly smaller than Lynchburg is today. There's no way general delivery gets your letter anywhere today. <laughs> but in the 1920s, this was possible. Dear Mr. Shear, regarding rubber shipment, or regarding rubber experiment, shipment of plants. We are in receipt of report from Reasoner Brothers at Oneko, Florida, giving us the receipt of the plants from you. They have listed all the receipts, but not by dates. The report is as follows. A1, B2, C3, D4, or D4, D9 to 11. This does not correspond with the shipments which we have received here at Orange, which give A1 and 2, B3 and 4, etc. Will you advise us relative to this and let us know what the markings should be of those that you have sent to Oneko? Yours very truly, J.V. Miller for Mr. Edison. And this was Ediphoned. So, the, so far, reading these letters, it does not seem like Shear was doing a spectacular job on um, properly documenting things for uh, the Edison lab. <clears throat> And here, here now we have uh, the envelope is listing the Edison Botanic Research Corp. This is from September of 1927. Plant guy needed an assistant and a professional archivist. Yeah. We're back to the nice curly cues. Cable address, Edison, New York. 
from the laboratory of Thomas A. Edison, Orange, New Jersey, September 2nd, 1927. Mr. G. Myron Shear, Roslyn, Virginia. Dear Mr. Shear, as the season has about drawn to a close when specimen plants can be planted here at Orange, Mr. Edison wishes me to advise you that after September 14th, your services will no longer be needed. And for you to send in your complete report of the work of collecting, final expense reports, and balance of capital, as, uh, and balance of capital advance. If you will kindly refer to your general instructions, you will see that you were to collect seeds where possible. Otherwise, if not yet ripened, you were to arrange with farmers or others to collect these and send them in later. We have not been advised by you as to this phase of your work, and we inquire whether, you, whether or not you have arranged with anyone to send in the seeds. Kindly give us a list of the names and addresses, if you have done so, so that we can follow up if necessary. Mr. Edison wishes me to thank you most sincerely for the work that you have done, and he wishes that some beneficial result will be derived from the specimens you have sent in. Yours truly, J.V. Miller, for Mr. Edison. <laughs> uh, Crafty Becky, entirely possible. It is entirely possible that this is a pink slip and that he was fired for not doing his job, but it's also entirely possible that that this was part of their prearranged thing that, you know, the growing season is ending and so you don't have a job, come back to us next year uh, when the growing season starts and we might have work for you then. That's entirely possible. I don't know, Abyssalicorus! <laughs> I'm sure that this is a kid that has never had a car before. I'm also sure he's clueless as to this. Uh, oh, definitely, he's 22. He was 22. Um, he is your normal college student who was doing work. Like, this was probably one of his very first jobs ever. Uh, and he's college age. So this is, this is like, um, this would be like an internship where you worked for the summer. <laughs> I know, there's, there's actually no mention of returning the car. So, I, I have no idea. <laughs> Entirely possible, Millie Glitch, that it was a summer temp job. Uh, that's not the last letter, though. We have, um, we have a couple more. So, this one is in an envelope labeled Laboratory of Thomas A. Edison. Addressed to Mr. G. Myron Shear, Botany Department, University of Illinois, Urbana, Illinois. The letterhead is the Edison Botanic Research Corporation. The last one was in uh, an envelope from the Edison Botanic Research Corporation, but was letterhead the Laboratory of Thomas Edison. This one is envelope Laboratory of Thomas Edison. Letterhead, Edison Botanic Research Corporation. It could have been a summer job for sure. You would think they would reference the contract, but that, yeah, I don't know. And, and these papers are not from Edison's lab. They probably have much better documentation of this. Uh, these letters are from Shear, who would have been 22, so like right at the end of his his degree program, um, what we would consider undergraduate degree today. Um, so we have a letter here from September 24th, 1927, to Mr. G. Myron Shear, Botany Department, University of Illinois, Urbana, Illinois, regarding rubber experiment. Dear Mr. Shear, enclosed herewith, we are sending you our check for $50 in payment of your salary for the period of September 1st, to 15th. $50 for two weeks in 1927 seems like a like pretty good pay. Uh, we wish to thank you for the work that you have done, and should anything of great value result from any specimens which you have sent in, we will sure we shall certainly notify you. Yours very truly, J.V. Miller for Mr. Edison. And they note there was an enclosure. <clears throat> so this was his. Uh, this this was just sending him his pay. So we know they paid him. Approximately $800 to date. So $800 for two weeks is not terrible. 
<clears throat> I would not say that it was minimum wage, but, you know, uh, attached to the, um, attached to the one with his paycheck, we have a photocopied newspaper article. So this is from the Washington Star, it looks like. We have a photograph of Edison here. Inventor studies rubber question here. Thomas A. Edison arriving at the Commerce Department yesterday on his visit to the Capitol to gather information on the possibilities of rubber production in America. The inventor recently has been making a close study of the problem. Edison on visit here to get rubber data. Inventor gathers information at government departments for use in South. Study of the possibilities for domestic production of rubber in the south southern part of the United States is believed to have been the purpose of a hurried visit to Washington yesterday by Thomas A. Edison, noted inventor, who took with him when he left the capital last night a batch of rubber seeds, specimens, and a quantity of data on rubber production in foreign countries. Officials of the Agriculture and Commerce Departments, where Mr. Edison called during the day, were reticent as to the probable results of his visit, declaring that they could make no statement except to say that the inventor sought all possible information on the methods of growing the, and range of growing of rubber-producing trees. Mr. Edison was understood to be seeking all the information available in government channels on rubber growing, particularly that about plants which produce rubber-like substances. He refused to discuss his project for publication, but left laden with samples, seeds, and data. Edison is known to have had many conferences with Henry Ford and Harvey Firestone on the possibility of United States production of rubber to make this nation independent of foreign rubber importation. As a result of the visit of the inventor, officials believe that Mr. Edison has been engaged for some time in a study of the rubber market and also investigation of the possibilities of rubber production, particularly in Florida. He was said to be following the method which has made him famous in the field of <clears throat> he was said to be following the method which has made him famous in the field of invention, that of marshalling every known method of production before launching into a new field. Government officials with whom he talked were optim optimistic after he departed and hopeful that the data given him would prove helpful, although they would not discuss his plans. <clears throat> Yeah, the eyes in the photo are a little disturbing. And also, uh, that was me trying to sight read in like that old like news announcer voice. Um, I could definitely do a better news announcer voice uh, sustained throughout if I wasn't at the tail end of um, an ear infection and if I was not sight reading. <laughs> but uh, I still think I did pretty good. And so the last thing in this folder is um, a letter here from the Commonwealth of Virginia, Division of Agriculture and Immigration, Division of Plant Industry, Richmond, or Department of Agricultural, uh, Agriculture and Immigration, Division of Plant Industry, Richmond, Virginia, July 12, 1927. To whom it may concern. This is to authorize Mr. G. M. Shear of Rosslyn, Virginia, to ship all species of um, Euphorbiaceae spurges and Asclepidaceae milkweeds from the state of Virginia. My understanding is that these shipments are to be made to the states of New Jersey and to Florida. This authorization is given to cover, of course, the requirements uh, only of the state of Virginia. The Virginia Nursery Inspection Law does not include species of spurges and milkweeds under its requirements at the present time, and therefore, so far as the inspection laws of this state are concerned, these plants are exempt from inspection and from uh, tag certificates of inspection. Furthermore, no, no registration under the law to cover shipments of these plants is required. Very truly yours, G.T. French, State Entomologist. <laughs> That's what I was going for, Miss Licorice. Old timey radio. <laughs> <clears throat> I stumbled a little bit at the end, but that was because I was getting to the point where my tongue was going to start tripping on itself because I was going a little bit faster than I probably should have been for sight reading. But 
it also felt like the appropriate pace for like breaking news bulletin type uh, radio announcer. Um, let's see what else we've got in here. The next one is general correspondence. I don't know if this is going to be as nearly interesting or nearly as interesting, but we'll take a look. Request for publications. This is a document asking for a copy of a publication from Professor Shear. 1970, so definitely a professor at that time. There are a number of these in here. People sending postcards saying, hey, would you send us a copy of your paper? The development of the... I'm trying to find out what, what paper they were interested in. The development of the no-tillage concept in the United States. Outlook on Agriculture, Volume 5, Number 6. Seems to be what they all wanted reprints of. Yeah, he went on. He became a prof professor here at Virginia Tech. Uh, so 1920, or at, at 22 years old in 1927 was not the most responsible researcher, but apparently provided enough benefit to the Edison company that they, they paid his check. Um, and then he later went on to become a professor of botany. So, um, we have a letter here from the Dow Chemical Company. July 6th, 1970. Dear G.M. Shear, Department of Plant Pathology and Physiology, Virginia Polytechnic Institute, your publication 342, No Tillage Corn, has proven of considerable interest to some of my colleagues, and the several copies we obtained seem to be gone. I wonder if you could spare an additional 10 or 12 copies. In the event you have not seen the paper Barry Reagan presented at the North Central Weed Control Conference last year on fall application of uh, Dalapon for quack grass. I think you might be interested. I think, they, I think they're making up words. Um, I, I, actually, I don't think they're making up words, but sure seems like they're making up words. First, a North Central Weed Control Conference? There are multiple weed control conferences divided by region? And I'm sorry, quack grass? Apparently a type of grass that we do not want. Uh, we had earlier assumed that grass should be sprayed while it is actively growing, but his work suggests that perhaps the best results can be obtained when it is green but relatively dormant because of cool weather. Of course, we know that quack grass is physiologically active at relatively low temperatures, so perhaps the, do uh, the toxicant is being absorbed and translocated efficiently even though the grass is not putting on growth. Conceivably, it could be useful in reducing perennial grasses in land to be farmed by no-tillage culture so that a lower dosage of herbicide effective on perennial grasses would have to be applied in the spring. <laughs> um, regional weed control makes sense because, I mean, it does, but just like, really? There's multiple weed control conferences? Quackgrass, uh, Elemus repens, is a cool season perennial that vigorously spreads by rhizomes. It is a sod forming grass that can crowd out desirable grasses and even other weeds. Quackgrass has been shown to be allelopathic, which means it releases chemicals that inhibit the growth of other plants. Quackgrass is the worst. Growing toward the sun, I guess with a username like that, you would know. Um, Agriculture is no joke, yeah. Quack grass management comes up in your turf science, for your turf science, interesting. We had a turf grass research center here at Virginia Tech. Um, it still exists, but now it's the home, like the place where the turf grass center was is the home of the um, indigenous garden now, uh, where using indigenous methods, um, 
agriculture students learn about planting um, different types of plants together for mutual benefit of the plants and to produce the most yield of usable plant materials. Um, it's, it's actually pretty cool. But it used to be the Turfgrass Research Center where they researched essentially grass, uh, ground cover. Um, sounds like the couch grass that you get. Roots are very sharp and stabbed through potatoes. I'm gonna start calling it goose grass. Uh, quack grass is a perennial that originated in, in Europe, Northern Africa, and temperate Asia and India. It came to the U.S. via contaminated hay and straw, which is moderately drought resistant. Or it's moderately drought resistant. So it's an invasive species. It is couch grass. <laughs> also, uh, good job, Abyssal Icarus' horticulture teacher. Thank you for the hydrate and the posture check, uh, Portico. <clears throat> Closely related based on the little bit of, okay. Oh, and uh, apparently also, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm losing things. It's a real hecking pain. It loves to grow and the rhizomes can regrow from broken bits. Well, apparently the Dow Chemical Company in 1970 was working on getting rid of it. Um, I, I won't say whether that's good or bad, uh, considering the Dow Chemical Company um, doesn't have the best ecological record, but uh, 1970s, they had a, a better reputation at least. Some perspectives. Uh, all this worry about rubber and alternatives to dependence on foreign sources in 1927, early 30s produced the first real successes in creating synthetic rubber. It was greatly ramped up by World War II. Most of the natural rubber sources were under Axis control. Interesting. Thank you, What's Not Worth It, for the... Uh, the information about the rubber production that was not contained in the archival collection. Like this would, this was just a very peripheral like, oh, Edison was collecting uh, latex bearing plants to study domestic rubber production. Um, but yeah, most of the natural rubber sources were under access, access control. <clears throat> I did not know that. Let's see, uh, I'm gonna look at this next letter. I love that so this is a perforated edge here. Um, so this this came out of some sort of book. So this is uh, from the Board of Trustees, the University of Illinois at Urbana, on July 16th, 1927. Mr. G. M. Shear in Roslyn, Virginia. So this is 27. Um... Dear Sir, the Board of Trustees of the University of Illinois has appointed you to the following position in the university, Assistant in Botany. On one-fourth time for 10 months beginning September 1st, 1927, at a cash compensation of $300. $300 for 10 months for a quarter-time position. Uh, payable in, ins in monthly installments in addition to a death to death benefits and retirement privileges. Um, and I mean, this is all boilerplate here. So this was at the same time that he started doing that work during the summer for the Edison Lab. He also had a quarter time position as a assistant in botany with the University of Illinois. <clears throat> Here's a letter from 79, so we're jumping all around in time now. Death benefits just sound wrong. Approximately $4,800 in today's... So that's not a terrible compensation for a quarter-time position uh, based on the amount that I know that our public institutions here in Virginia currently pay for a quarter-time position. Although that was an Illinois, uh, an Illinois position, but just... 
uh, adjusting to today's dollars, 4,000 is not a terrible amount for a quarter time position, uh, around here at least. <laughs> I'm not gonna say it's a good amount, but it's not unheard of, uh, and that would be kind of a normal compensation amount. Um, Dr. Weiss, uh, Texas Agricultural Experiment Station, Dr. So this is, this is from, oh, okay, so this is a letter from Myron Shear. Dear Alan, I am enclosing the final copy of the chapter Introduction and History of Limited Tillage. And then there's a response. Dear Myron, your paper arrived in good order. I will get two people to help me edit the paper. Thank you very much for the paper and your home address. Uh, let's see. I'm looking for interesting ones. Um, American Society of Agricultural Engineers. Okay, so here's the thing. This is another request for this professor to send copies of his papers. So, academic publishing is a racket. Uh, <laughs> and it was, this is 1986, a lot of these are from the 1970s. Um, it was back then too. Like, did all the research, was paid to do research. Uh, assuming he was not, at this point in time, uh, somebody who was paying a journal to publish him. Um, published, did extra effort to get peer reviewed and get published in the journal, but was not paid by the journal for that paper. Um, and then now people are asking for free copies of the paper, which I will say, if it was paywalled by the journal, meaning that their library had to pay to have the journal or they needed to pay for a copy of the paper from the journal, going directly to the author and saying, hey, can you send me a copy is a way around that. And a lot of times the author will send you one for free, but that's additional labor that's being caused by the fact that a, an article has been paywalled. Um, and many times the, the researcher would like their research to be out there and be cited and be used. And clearly he had articles that people were interested in. Um, and the fact that they're writing to him asking for copies, like we had one request earlier that was for 10 copies of his paper. Um, the only reason they would be doing that is if it cost a lot of money to get it directly from the journal. <laughs> SSRN is your friend. Not available in 1986. Uh, oh, wow. What? I don't know what this is. This is... Neither of the people on this letter are sheer. I think this was just copied to him. Selection Committee for the No-Till Pioneer Award? I'm guessing he, he must have been a judge on the award? But also, like, no-till agriculture, I don't know much about, but that is um, what this is, what he apparently uh, was an expert in no-till agriculture. Selection process for the no-tillage pioneer of the year. Yeah, he was on the selection committee for the award. Yeah, Millie, um, it, it looks like he was on the committee, which was administered by the Ohio Agricultural Research and Development Center. I'm gonna skip some of the, the award ones here. Look and see if we've got anything else that's particularly interesting. Otherwise, we will move on and look at more of his stuff because there's more stuff here and we've still got the photographs to look at very shortly here. Um, Oh! 
Okay. This one, this one strikes me as interesting. I, I'm, I'm actually gonna read this. Nine September, nineteen seventy-four. Dr. George M. Shear. Dear Dr. Shear, with the endorsement of President Hahn, uh, we write to solicit your interest and aid in the development of the archives in the Newman Library of Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. Many persons fail to realize that they generate in personal correspondence and business papers a priceless record of their times. Because the files of an important and busy person increase steadily, the problem of what to do with them too often is answered by destroying all of the dead files. Few have the space to store all of them or the time to weed out for retention the most important. President Hahn is setting an example by sending to the archives, to, uh, to the archives division of the Newman Library, all records from the president's office before 1960. We wish you would consider placing your family papers, your student and wartime papers, and your dead files of business records among the collections being formed at Virginia Tech. The sheer papers would take their place alongside such as the Governor J. T. Hogue, uh, sorry the Governor J. Hogue Tyler Papers, the Preston Papers, and the J. Ambler Johnston Papers. We hope that you will want to aid in adding to our collection of archival materials and historic manuscripts because of the many years of distinguished service that you gave this university as Professor of Plant Pathology. May we suggest some points to consider in making your decision. If you give or deposit family or business records here, you will be able to you will be able still to use them. Our trained staff will not only secure your records against fire, mice, extremes of humidity or heat, and such insects as silverfish, but they will compile an analytical guide to the records. Of course, reasonable restrictions on use uh, may be imposed by the donor. These papers will be most useful in the university's research program. With proper permission, a company history or biographical study might be written by scholars from such records. Although these are priceless records of the near and distant past, they do have a monetary value. Such gifts made to the VPI Educational Foundation for the benefit of the university are tax deductible, and we would be pleased to help secure an appraisal of their value for income tax deduction purposes. All gifts are acknowledged and recorded in the appropriate gift records of the Foundation. Finally, the Newman Library will be glad to assist in removing from your attic or office any materials you might wish to make available for the Archives collection. All you have to do is communicate with the Acting Director of Libraries, Mr. H. Gordon Beckinen. Sincerely yours, George Green Shackelford, Chairman. Um, I will note that today we do not typically offer to help with the appraisal process beyond uh, directing them to people who can conduct the appraisal. Um, otherwise, if they want an appraisal for tax deduction purposes, that is up to them to obtain. Uh, but I just, this is really, really interesting. It's like, I, I've not seen this letter before. <laughs> Abyssal Icarus, this is not the reason we were reading them, but, um, I, I decided to read that letter because I saw that it was about the development of the archives. <laughs> it is, Millie Glitch. It is the very first time that I've come across one of these uh, request letters. Give or deposit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There, We could go into a lot of stuff about deposit. Um, uh, we don't really want... Or we don't... We will do everything in our power to avoid having records deposited now because they're just too much of a pain to, um, to manage. Uh, if we're going to do all the work to deal with the records, we want to own the records. <laughs> uh, but that, w that was neat. I, I think that, that was really, really neat. Um, and, and yeah, I had not seen one of those before. Other than, like, our current communications on stuff like that. Uh, so deposit in this context would be um, that they give us the records, but they retain ownership of them and can pull them back at any time that they want. So we would, 
we would be housing them, describing them, caring for them, processing them to make sure that they were in archival quality boxes, doing all of the work that we do with records, but we wouldn't own the records and they could take them away whenever they wanted. That we basically don't do anymore. Um, instead, if we're going to take their records, we're going to insist that they donate them, meaning transferring ownership of them to us so that once they're a part of our collections and we do all of that work, they're always here and cannot be removed simply by the person who gave them to us asking for them back. Uh, it helps us to maintain the, the integrity of our collections so that if somebody's citing something that we had, we still have it. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. We're not a personal secretarial service to organize a backlog, to organize backlog. If they want to retain ownership of the records and want to have them professionally organized, there are plenty of freelance archivists out there who can be hired to do that work. Um, and if they don't want to pay the going rates for a professional archivist to do it, you can all, often hire um, archivists to work as interns supervised by an archival organization to do that work so that they get experience that makes them more hireable in an actual archives position. So there are multiple ways that they can have uh, stuff professionally done um, and that would be kind of the direction that I would point people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, hi, Galara Dragon. And yeah, a welcome officially to the, the Rogues Gallery. Um, let's see. I want to just... There's more stuff to look at, and I'm going to skip through a lot of this. We've got various chemical companies here. Stoller, Chevron... A letter from the Task Force on World Hunger, Presbyterian Church in the United States. A few of those letters. Um, Brazil. A lot of this is still just like, hey, send us copies of your articles that you've written. That seems to be the bulk of what's in, in here. Um, so I say we move on to the next folder. Strange name for a church. I don't think the Presbyterian Church is a strange name. Um, let's see. Virginia Agricultural Experiment Station Publications. The effect of nutrition on the chemical composition of wine sap apple foliage. It's a color publication. It's in color. This is uh, by George Shear. This Kodachrome of wine sap apples from Orchard C, 1942, well illustrates the effect of fertilizer on fruit size and color. Left to right rows vertical one no, no fertilizer, two, sodium nitrate, three, sodium nitrate, uh, superphosphate and potassium chloride, four, superphosphate and potassium chloride, and five, potassium chloride. Note the larger size and lighter color of fruit from trees that received nitrate. So this is an agricultural experiment station, and this is the type of thing that the agricultural experiment station does. They actually do agricultural experiments. So they had various apple trees. Um, these are wine sap apples. And they gave them different combinations of fertilizer to see what the result was. That is a great question, Galara Dragon. I will look inside and we'll see if we can figure it out. Um, I'm guessing no. <laughs> this this I do believe you are probably correct. Um, I don't know a lot about the, the wine sap apple in particular. Ch -ch 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 -ch. 
I'm just uh, skimming to look and see if there's any mention of taste. Ah, okay, so table seven here. Sucrose expressed as percentage of fre fresh weight in wine sap apples from plots receiving different fertilizer treatments. Which is grand, except I don't know which fertilizers are which. Oh, oh, oh. But I don't know. Oh, oh, oh has, uh, it appears, the largest amount of sucrose most in most of the test batches on that chart. But I don't know what it means. I'm not a botanist, and I don't see an explanation of the tables that indicates what that lettering means. <laughs> so, I don't know. Um... Let's, let's read the summary and conclusions. Maybe it will tell us. Yeah, K would be potassium, N would be nitrogen. Um, and the experiment was using sodium nitrate, superphosphate, and potassium chloride, though. Uh, so what OOO would be, I don't know. Could be control or none. Yeah. <clears throat> and if it was the control, it would be like, oh. The control had the best, or the, the sweetest apples, at least. Lots of factors in an apple. Flavor, sweetness, texture, skin, uh, skin toughness, all affect how much you want to eat it. But your sure big orchard mostly cares about color and size. Um, indeed, indeed, Galara, um, if you look at the history of the Red Delicious apple, they used to be uh, modeled skin tone. Um, and taste better and be less mealy. But over time, growers uh, grew and selected for apples that were sh had shinier, redder skins. Um, and they went for look over taste and texture. And red delicious apples became more mealy and less sweet over time because those aspects of the apple were bred out as they were breeding for redder, shinier fruit. Um, same thing with the yellow delicious, like they ultimately bred for better looking apples, which led to apples that tasted worse and had less pleasant texture. Um, today we have other types of apples, other uh, crosses of apples with new names that do different things. One of the one of the things that came along and replaced the bad tasting but good looking red delicious was the Honeycrisp, which was uh, developed by the University of Minnesota. Um, so yeah, there are <laughs> there are things. The sweetest apples are the ones that they don't mess with. Most fertilizers list the NPK ratio, which tracks. Also, see tomatoes. Red Delicious apples are pretty to look at, but you don't like to eat them. However, fresh picked Golden Delicious. Oh, really, Hannah? I did not know that. I haven't, um, so Golden Delicious are different than Yellow Delicious. Uh, but I don't know that I've had a Golden Delicious in a long time. When I go to the store, the ones that I find are things like Jazz Apples or uh, Honey Crisps or, um, uh, they, they all have new names. Pink Ladies, um, although I think Pink Ladies are now called Crips Apples. Uh, th they're various names. I always have to have my phone nearby to look up the apple variety to find out what it's like. My favorite are Gra Granny Smith, um, which are very firm and tart. Uh, those are my favorite apples. And so when I'm looking to try something new, I'm also looking for something that's on the firmer side and the tartar side. Uh, but yeah. Decline of the Brayburn. They used to be your go-to tart, crunchy apple, but they're getting bigger and sweeter. I did not know that about Brayburns. 
Gala is your favorite. Nature's roulette wheel. Royal Gala apples are big red and pretty apples. They have a season of like three days where they aren't flowery. Oh, oh dear. Well, I'm gonna read the conclusions that we have in here and see if it, if it tells us anything. From 1940 through 1944, a study was con conducted on the effects of different fertilizers on the percentage of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in the foliage of wine sap apples. Nitrogen and potassium, and to a lesser extent phosphorus, were higher in leaf samples collected in June than in September samples. Applications of nitrate, either alone or in combination with phosphate and potash, resulted in an increase in the nitrogen content of the foliage. The phosphorus and potassium content, content of the foliage was not affected by nitrate fertilization, either alone or combined with phosphate and potash compared with no fertilizer. The placement of phosphate and potash in holes failed to increase the percentage of these nutrients in the foliage. The phosphorus con content of the foliage was lower when the phosphate was placed in holes than where it was broadcast. Broadcast meaning you just toss it on top of the ground um, and sprinkle it around. The best nitrogen level in the foliage of wine sap apples cannot be determined exactly from this study, but it would appear to be 1.8% or higher of the dry weight of leaves collected about September 1st. These data also indicate that a phosphoric acid, con con that a phosphoric acid content of approximately 0.5% and a potassium content of approximately 1.1% for leaves collected about September 1st are adequate. If these levels of phosphorus and potassium are present, applications of phosphate and potassium fertilizers to the trees would not be justified. Under orchard conditions similar to those where this study was conducted, annual applications of some nitrogenous fertilizer would be necessary to maintain an adequate nitrogen level in the foliage. The use of a com complete fertilizer would not be justified under these conditions except where phosphate and potash are necessary for the growth of cover crops in which case they should be applied to the cover crop rather than to the trees. Nothing about how they taste. <laughs> Last time you tried to eat a Granny Smith, it was so sour, your teeth hurt for two days. Oh my gosh, Galara. I, I love them. They're my favorite. Uh, they've been a go-to apple of mine since I was a kid. Um, Brayburns were slightly green, smallish, firm, and crunchy for ages up until about 10 years ago, and they've suddenly started being redder, larger, and less firm and tart. Clearly, they've started selecting for different standards and variety. Yeah. Um, that's, it's a thing that happens. They definitely go for what's going to be pretty in store and get you to, to pick it up, rather than for the best flavor in all cases. Oh! The improvement of watercress culture. Purnell Fund Project, Virginia Agricultural Experiment Station, GM Shear and GM Jackson. Uh, the, the reason I, I reacted to this this way uh, was because uh, in the finding aid it mentioned that he did research on watercress. Let's look at the, the problem and summary and conclusions. That, that's what we will look at on in this one. The Improvement of Watercress Culture, Purnell Fund Project. Introduction, the problem. On the basis of a preliminary survey, it was found that the plant and animal pests of watercress were not uniformly distributed over the cress-producing section of Virginia. It was therefore considered advisable to make a more intensive study of the fauna and flora of springs and cress beds in order to evaluate the importance of these biological factors and possibly discover natural enemies of some pests that might be useful in their control. So particularly looking at um, <clears throat> the pests that cause disruption to cultivation of watercress, um, what are other names for watercress? In case people are not familiar with the, the name watercress. I'm going to just do a little googly search here. 
watercress. Watercress is a leafy green. Um, watercress or yellowcress, species of aquatic flowering plant in the cabbage family. Rapidly growing perennial plant native to Europe and Asia, one of the oldest known leaf vegetables con consumed by humans. Watercress and many of its relatives, such as garden cress, mustard, radish, and wasabi, are noteworthy for their piquant flavors. The hollow stems of watercress float in water. The leaf structure is pinnately compound. Small white and green flowers are produced in clusters and are frequently visited by insects, especially hoverflies. Cool. Watercress is tricky. Oh, you, you know what it's related to, but not other names. So yellowcress is, is the only other name that was mentioned. Uh, it has a very short season and pretty specific growing requirements, which makes it a pain to cultivate, but great if you enjoy gathering wild food. You have a kind of watercress there called puha, which you're not sure is actually related, but is treated the same way. Cool. So I'm gonna see, they were, they were looking at insect and plant um, pests. So let's see what their summary and conclusions are. <clears throat> a survey of the Watercress Association and Culture was made in 45 spring systems in Western Virginia. Uh, Mancasilis brachiurus harger, watercress sobug, fontigens, uh, SP, spring snails, sorry, and aquatic lumbricidae, earthworms, are the only aquatic groups that have been observed to actually injure crests for market. Terrestrial forms as slugs, leaf hoppers, beetles, cabbage worms, aphids, and others are known to injure the aerial shoots. Filamentous algae, lemna, SPP or duckweed, Veronica anagallis aquatica, water speedwell, and Calistrichi, um, I don't know, a water starwort. The, the words are kind of... Uh, the, the ink is kind of messed up there, so I can't exactly make out what those last letters are, but it's water starwort, are the only plants that have been observed to be significantly detrimental. Three general methods of control are believed to be the most practical in dealing with the above. No one of which is considered 100% effective. Algae, crystalline copper sulfate in a cloth bag suspended in the spring in the most is the most satisfactory method of controlling algae. This material dissolves slowly and diffuses to all parts of the bed. This material is also reported to be partially effective against uh, mencasilis and oligocates if a high concentration can be maintained as when most of the water can be bypassed. The oligocates are, eager, are easier to kill than the mancasilis. We mentioned, I don't know what all these things are. Sorry, scientific names, I would have to look them up. But those were like the worms and whatnot. Aquatic plants and animals. Drainage and cultivation of the bed and direct weeding are most effective against aquatic plants and animals. Watercress, like any other crop, does, be, does best when well cared for. Terrestrial animals, uh, flooding, for 24 to 36 hours will eliminate terrestrial animals. This is, of course, ineffective if the cress has been uprooted by aquatic species. So, yeah, I mean, if you want to get rid of aquatic-based pests, drain the water. If you want to get rid of land-based pests, add water. <laughs> I mean, they seem um, kind of obvious as solutions, 
but they are solutions that are not relying on chemical pesticides and uh, have been tested so you know that they work, which is a difference to just trying it and seeing. You know that it's going to work because they tested it and know that it will work. Um, let's see. Reprints and extracts. TypeScript, bibliography. <laughs> all right, this is the last one of his that we're going to look at, and then we're going to look at the scrapbook that has all the photos. Um, no nonsense guide to no-till farming. Uh, un unsure exactly when. Uh, it says 1969 question mark. This is published by. Alice Chalmers, Farm Equipment Division, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Hi, Orangitis. How are you today? We have not been talking oranges today. We've been talking apples and watercress. But I don't. Your name makes me think of oranges, so. Um, I don't know what no-till farming is. So I'm glad we have this no-nonsense guide. Hopefully it will tell me. Since the very beginning of agriculture, man has been in a continuous struggle to improve both crops and the cultural methods of producing them. The early realization of the detrimental effects of competition between weeds and food plants could easily have been cause for man to abandon his nomadic nature and start cultivating his own food plants. This is where tillage got its start. The early farmer found it necessary to stir the soil to place the crop seed where it could obtain the needed water and nutrients for germination and growth, and to eliminate competition from weeds. These basic requirements for successful food production stimulated the development of a series of tillage tools, from the crude stick to sophisticated power tillers. The process of evolution in tillage procedures has been continuous for thousands of years, but not until the recent development of chemical herbicides has the very concept of tillage been challenged. Economic and conservation demands of recent years have prompted many serious efforts to reduce or eliminate, eliminate tillage. Further refinements in chemical herbicides during the past decade, coupled with the development of and prefection of no-tillage planting equipment, have removed the major barriers that have tied tillage to the farming scene for centuries. Several years of university research and on-the-farm tests have been de decisive. Minimum tillage farming, in one of its many forms, is here to stay. In many areas of the country and with several crops, the no-till system holds the secret of success to reduce tillage and no-tillage crop production. Its outstanding performance has prompted many scientists, conserv conservationists, and farmers to echo our advice. Don't wait till next year. Go no-till farming today, the Alice Chalmers way. Oh, dear, dear. <laughs> We're talking botany, but we're not reading the Garden Tool Company sponsored one act playlet about victory gardens from World War II. Um, we are not, Elixi, because I didn't pull anything from the Rare Books collection. I only pulled from our finding aids and I pulled both collections that list botany as a subject. That is how we came up with the two collections we're looking at today. Parsley, peppers, cabbages, and celery, asparagus, and watercress, and fiddle fern, and lettuce. I don't think so, Galara Dragon. I think it is just because of the, like, tilling the soil bit. Um, second. Regarding watercress... Puha, known as Maori watercress, inaccurately, it turns out, is absolutely not related to watercress and is a type of sow thistle, though it is cooked the same way and used in the same dishes as watercress. No, that is great new information, Abyssa Licorice. Thank you for sharing. Greens, greens, nothing but greens. <laughs> I love the reference to Sondheim. 
Um, so, yeah, I don't know. We've got minimum tillage saves time. Lowers production costs, controls weather erosion. There's this whole book on, like, not tilling the soil and just tossing the seeds around and watering them and, and hoping stuff grows, which apparently, according to the intro to this book that we read, what's, what I find really interesting is that no-till still has this bladed thing that you run through the ground, which to me is tilling the soil. Uh, apparently not as a botanist or agriculture expert myself, I am apparently incorrect in that, but, um, yeah. You're looking at a new gelatin pamphlet and it contains a macaroni loaf recipe with white cabbage and green pepper. I don't think that counts as botany elixir. Uh, no-till farming is using soil enriching plants between crops to break up the soil rather than tilling it. It conserves soil. Oh, thank you, Abyssal Licorice, for the clarification. I I was very confused about like, what does this mean? Um, but according to the initial description of this, on this, it really seems like no-till soil or no-till farming relies very heavily on um, uh, chemical pest control, which, um, they were they were touting quite heavily in this in this booklet, uh, but which today you know the chemical stuff is what um, all of the organic labels are trying to move away from. Let's see. Oh, okay. Here we go. Uh, I'm glad you all are able to look this stuff up or know this stuff. It's really helpful. Um, you cut up the plants and leave them on top of the soil as a kind of fertilizer. Your dad once had a book called No Dig, No Weed Gardening. It didn't work. <laughs> According to Wikipedia, no-till farming, also known as zero tillage or direct drilling, is an agricultural technique for growing crops or pasture without disturbing the soil through tillage. Uh, no-till farming decreases the amount of soil erosion tillage causes in certain soils, especially in sandy and dry soils on sloping terrain. Other possible benefits include an increase in the amount of water that infiltra infiltrates into the soil, soil retention of organic matter, and nutrient cycling. Cool. Yeah, you still have to like do a little bit of tilling, but apparently it is a different method, which would be why it has a name. So, uh, that is the last that we are going to be looking at the George Meyer and Shear papers together. They were actually really fascinating. I love that no matter what collection we pull, um, we always find something unique and interesting to talk about. And I, I really enjoy the conversations that we have. Um, these methods may increase the amount and variety of life in and on the soil, while conventional no-tillage systems use herbicides to control weeds. Organic systems use a combination of strategies, such as planting cover crops as mulch to suppress weeds. Has to be pretty carefully managed, otherwise you just get a mess, and yes, it can be heavy on the spraying. Oh yes, Galara Dragon, no-till with the capitalized one L was definitely a trademark. <laughs> All right, so next I have to adjust this camera. Sorry for the moving things around quite that much. Um, but this is a wide book. So turning pages and getting the camera on it at the same time not the easiest. So, product names with alternate spellings and or simple, yeah, yeah, Galera Dragon, that is common. Um, <clears throat> so we are moving on now to the Stockton Mosby McMurrin scrapbook, circa 1909. Which was the other collection that in our finding aids was marked with the subject heading botany. So Stockton Mosby McMurrin 
1887 to 1920 was from Campbell County, Virginia, and he was a member of the German Club when he attended VPI. Uh, German Club is like a fraternity um, here at Virginia Tech. It goes back a long time. It's somewhat problematic. After graduating from VPI in 1909, he attended Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, where he received his Master of Arts in Botany in 1911. McMurrin worked as assistant pathologist for the U.S. Department of Agriculture until his death in 1920. The Stockton Mosby McMurrin scrapbook, circa 1909, is a photograph album with pictures of the Missouri Botanical Garden and pictures from Virginia Polytechnic Institute. The first half of the scrapbook includes the following pictures from the Botanical Garden. The Missouri Botanical Garden Shelter, Pagoda, greenhouses, gardens, famous botanists, and related field scientists. The second half of the album includes the following picture from VPI, Price Hall, Lane Hall, Campus Views, Countryside, Barnes, The Grove, Track Meets, Joe Luttrell, Hughes, and McCown are individuals identified in the track meet pictures. Apparently received with this was a copy of the 1909 Bugle, which is the yearbook, and the 1909 Tin Horn, which is the women's yearbook, which was published separately that year, and those were removed and put into the Rare Books collection. So yeah, we're gonna look at some pictures from 1909. <laughs> oh, did it not work, Portico? Oh, gotcha, the, the, you missed a space there the first time. <laughs> Hi, Castabras, how are you today? All right, so this first one, um, oh dear, we're gonna get the shinies. Let's see, I have a wedge. I have a foam wedge that I'm gonna put under this to angle it so that hopefully we get less shiny on the pictures. So, you probably cannot see it because it's very, very small in the picture and you're gonna get more of like a large photograph view here. But um, at the top of this arch in words showing up, hang on. These are glossies, I need my, I need, I need a glove, they're glossies. Here at the very top, it says Missouri Botanical Garden, 1858. So this is the entrance, I assume, to the Missouri B Botanical Garden. And these, um, these photos, just based on the way they're looking, I think they may be silver nitrate photos. Uh, Like, I'm not 100% certain, but the the quality of the f image and the reflectiveness of it, it they look like they were developed with silver nitrate, um, which was a standard um, chemical used for developing f uh, photography. Um, and I don't know how well that comes across on stream, but the actual lighting in here, when I get um, the shine on it, the black parts actually look, they reflect silver, which is a characteristic of the silver nitrate development process. So, um, here we have the pagoda that was mentioned. Um, I can't, the way I have the camera situated, I can't turn it, but this is, this is the pagoda from the um, Missouri Botanical Gardens. Above this arch here, it says Henry Shaw. Hmm. 
very lush botanical gardens there in uh, the late 1800s in Missouri. The last botanical gardens that I visited was um, Des Moines. I haven't been to very many. Um, I've been to the, the ones in Des Moines a few times because they used to have bird shows there. <laughs> I would go and uh, learn all about the parrots that they had. Um, I'm going to refer to the finding aid because I don't know what all of these photos are. So we had, it, it mentioned that there was the photo of the pagoda. Um, greenhouses, gardens. So yeah, I don't know specifically what this building is. It is also part of the Missouri Botanical Gardens. You've heard of the Des Moines, the Des Moines one is really nice. It's definitely worth visiting, Hannah. Um, since I do believe that it is not terribly distant from you. Um, I've been there, like I said, a couple of times because uh, they used to do um, uh, companion bird shows there uh, where you could go and learn about different varieties of companion birds, um, all the like toys and uh, food products for companion birds, uh, companion birds being like the different um, parrot and finch type species that people keep as pets. Um, they have a tiny weed problem in the chimney. Maybe, just, just maybe. <laughs> um, this looks like a greenhouse. You can tell, you can see like the, the glass panels up here at the top. Some of them are open to provide some ventilation. Um, but yeah, this is definitely a greenhouse of some sort. I just thought it would be nice to spend some time. We did all the document stuff and now we're just looking at some pictures. This one is very foggy. Um, uh, not because it's actually foggy, just that's the the image has aged, and over time, um, the image itself has become foggy. I don't know specifically what building this is. It is a, it is a nice looking building. I just I don't know what specific building it is, but this would be St. Louis, Missouri. Um, right? I am remembering the right location. Yeah, Washington University, St. Louis, Missouri. Um, you went to the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens last summer. You didn't go to the greenhouse and stayed to and tried to stay social distance, but it was still scary. Yeah, um, I, I can imagine going to some of these places would be very scary right now. Um, so, you know, go when you're comfortable. The, uh, I've, I don't know, I've been to some place that was similar to a botanical garden in Brooklyn. Um, Kira, you might remember where we went, where they had the red panda that we were looking at when we were in New York. I don't remember where that was. Looks like a Seattle building, or no, a St. Louis building. Sorry, STL, uh, my brain went to Seattle, but STL is St. Louis. Yeah, these are these would be good, like historic buildings. You can see the little um, Chinese style uh, lions out front. Um, this says, Botanical Museum and Library, founded 1853, Henry Shaw. So that is the Museum and Library. Trying to not slide out of frame. That's very pretty. Um, outdoor cultivated area. Looks like maybe flower gardens. 
um, with this lovely domed structure in the back. I can't uh, can't make out the first word, but preceding cuts in select fungonomy, carpologia, volume two, eighteen sixty three, copied from the original. So these are um, just examples of some specific botany items illustrated and included in here. It looks like frustration to me, but I, 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 it doesn't seem to track meaning-wise, but it could be that. We've got another domed structure. Apparently the Botanic Gardens in St. Louis have a few domed structures. Uh, I wasn't expecting uh, free-floating images here. Here's another look at the domed structure with the outdoor garden. Let's see. I'm going to flip through a few of them quickly, see if there's anything really striking like this. Um, there's the outdoor garden again and a very large area here with uh, this is all greenhouse here. Um, but we are coming to the end of stream, so I just want to like flip through quickly and see if anything else pops out at us as particularly interesting. Uh, statue of the goddess Juno. Does anybody know why that would be at a botanic garden? I'm trying to think back, but I've blocked a lot of Greek mytholog,y or I guess that might be Roman myth mythology for Juno. some interiors of some of the greenhouses. They've got cacti growing in St. Louis. That's pretty cool. Looks like a lecture hall. And some of the botanists who we could look up and research if we wanted to, but uh, we basically don't have much time left, so I'm not going to. A lovely image here of a plant. I don't know what plant, but it's a plant. And we're talking botany. <laughs> like, so one of the things here, uh, and we've moved on from the St. Louis, like we have this in our collection and it's a lovely piece, but basically all of these images are unlabeled. So unless the building had words on it, you wouldn't know what it was which means it is very limited for research purposes. Um, and if I was to check, we probably don't use this very often. Uh, and as you can see, now my glove has been stained because this book has a little bit of red rot, um, the cover does, which is just the decomposition of the cover itself. Um. <laughs> Maybe to watch over the peacocks that inevitably show up. Yeah. Um, all right. So I'm going to switch to face here. Um, we are at the end of our time for today. I, I want to thank you all for joining me on this journey as we um, looked at these just somewhat random botanical collections um, that literally the only connection between them was that they were marked with the botany subject heading in our finding aids database. 
Um, and they were the only two, and I was like, let's take a look at them and see what they have to offer. Uh, so that is how we found that today, and, and I do appreciate you all stopping by and joining me and, and hanging out through the whole thing. I think it was fun. Um, we spent most of it on the very fascinating George Meyer and Shear papers, um, and then, you know, just ended with some, some looks at some unlabeled photographs, which is less interesting than it sounds, but um, I also enjoyed that. Next week, on Wednesday at 2.30 p.m., I will be returning for another archival adventure. And next week, we will be looking at the freeze textile plant uh, materials. Um, there is a, the, the story of how we got the materials is just as fascinating as the materials themselves. There are hundreds of boxes. Um, I have reduced that to about 15 or so boxes that I need to now go through and select individual folders uh, so that we have a limited uh, selection of material. But essentially, um, the Freeze Textile Plant uh, was the sole operating business in Freeze, Virginia. Freeze, Virginia was a company town. People bought their goods at the company store. They had their mortgages with the company. The uh, Freeze textile plant ran all of the schools, um, all of the extracurriculars for people. Like everything was through Freeze and the mill eventually shut down. Um, we have the papers from Freeze, Virginia. Uh, including records of the textile plant, and we're going to be taking a look at those next week. So it'll be a fascinating time. Um, <laughs> and it's definitely been a pleasure having you all here. I'm just going to double check and see. I'm guessing we're probably going to go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Was not worth it. Uh, I appreciate definitely having you here as well. Um, I'm glad that you appreciate the stream. Um, let's see. Just looking to see if there's anything else that pops out as interesting to go to after today's. We are though going to do our normal raid over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They have the shark cam up today. Uh, so enjoy the uh, looking at some underwater images of sharks. Um, that is where we're gonna go. I'm just gonna set up those raids on both channels. Uh, And one second while I set it up over here as well. Yes, so I do hope that you will join me again next Wednesday when we take a look at the Freeze Textile Plant records. Um, it should be a good time, and um, I can't remember what's coming up after that, but we'll have more fascinating and interesting things from the archives here at Virginia Tech coming up weekly. Um, I, I have so much fun with this stream, and... Um, yeah, I, I'm happy to see all of you here for this um, and look forward to seeing you again in the future. Uh, have fun exploring the archives and history out there in the world. Um, I will see you again next time. <laughs>